Your next vehicle from Community Motors of Mason City. Great service from three locations. Community on Monroe, Community Motors Westside, and Mason City Ford. Ten new franchises and hundreds of vehicles to give you more choices. Plus, Community offers an exclusive 3-3 warranty on pre-owned vehicles and 10-year, 250,000-mile warranty on new. Need more reasons why? Stop or visit communityautogroup.com. Because nobody beats a community deal. No. I'm for the public forum. Mayor and City Council <coughs> public comments for the public on agenda items only. Uh, during the public forum, you're asked to give your name, address, and agenda item, uh, number or topic that you'll be talking about, and you'll have, about five, you'll have five minutes. And the clock is right up there. Just a quick note on the uh, public hearing um, for the uh, urban renewal plan for number 17 and number 18. Um, and number 19, um, you would speak to those at the public hearing. So hold off on those, and that's 17, 18, and 19. Uh, other than that, the other items are open for the public forum. Mr. Hudson. I'm Paul Hudson, I'm at Thousand Court Street, Southwest, I'm representing Mercy on agenda item number 20. And from the last city council meeting, we had a list of 12 uh, questions that we were asked to respond to. And uh, that information is in the city council packet, as well as on the website. And what I wanted to do was to talk uh, just very briefly um, about item number, question number three, and question number five, which talked about uh, traffic flow, uh, as well as the environmental impact. We hired Snyder and Associates, a um, highly recommended uh, firm um, out of the Des Moines area, uh, to measure um, the traffic impact um, as, as uh, they could with the information that we had uh, provided, both from um, city engineering measurements as well as um, three days of individual traffic counts that we did um, internally. That information is, um, results of that um, is in the packet. Uh, we did the same thing uh, with the environmental impact, and uh, they provided uh, the overall um, review of those. Um, from the environmental impact study, there were five um, items um, that were listed as outcomes, and uh, we're planning on incorporating those outcomes into our final plan. Um, the last thing I'll mention, um, as we've gone through our design process, and we have a group of our consultants um, with us, uh, from the Yankee Colby, Lotus Engineering, and Berkeley and Cram Architecture, is wanting to make sure that um, uh, it feels difficult to build next to a residential area. Uh, we want to make sure that we took input and provided um, those items um, that uh, would improve the design that came from the community uh, into uh, the plans that we have and going now. Specifically, uh, we modified the buffer design. Um, we decided that it would be an improvement to keep um, 63 Linden Drive in place and modify the East Access Drive. Uh, we would put the utilities uh, in the street, which would uh, prevent um, any damage to a tree structure. And then finally, we removed the retention pond that we're planning at the east end of the site and uh, investing in a more expensive pervious pavement uh, program. So these individuals uh, will have some short um, items to add and then will be available for mayor and council's questions. Thank you. Thank you, sir. <coughs> Good evening. <clears throat> I'm Randy Cram with Berkeley Cram Architects here in Mason City, and we're the project architects for the proposed uh, Mercy Medical Center uh, Energy Center and Loading Dock Improvement Project. And in your packet, <clears throat> we addressed um, your question number one, which <coughs> was, uh, you know, what options did you look at for this facility? And please comment on those. So, before I do that, I the design team, we, we came up with several goals and objectives on this project before we actually started looking at alternatives of where we would put these facilities. 
and I'm just going to quickly go through those. Um, there was a need to eliminate a lot of the cross vehicular um, bottlenecks that it's really congested back there at the loading dock. Um, so we really need to improve safety back there, security to the back of the house and the hospital. Um, they really need one point of access for all their goods and services to come into the hospital. Right now they house a lot of their products um, off site and they have to transport them several times to get to the hospital. So we want to improve that um, ability for the hospital. Um, they really need to separate their clean and dirty functions of delivery and pickup at the back end of the house there. Uh, right now it all kind of, the kitchen, the dirty, the clean, all kind of comes in one area. You know, this loading dock has been this way since the 1960s. So as we all know, the hospital is really, I don't know if it's quadrupled in size since the, when it was built in the 50s, but it's a lot bigger. But the back of the house, the loading dock energy center area has not changed. So it's in desperate need of improvements to improve uh, you know, quality of health care in our community. Um, the generators, one of the, several of the goals for the generators was put them on grade so they're easy to maintain and get to. Um, enclose them so we can avoid uh, uh, them not operating during storms. Uh, you know, enclose the noise, a lot of just safety features like that. And um, then on grade access for the loading dock, really important so we're not lifting things up and down for safety. Um, some of the options that were looked at, uh, we looked at putting the energy center where Macaulay Hall is. There just isn't enough room to the west property line to stick it in there. And it didn't solve the loading dock issue. <clears throat> we looked at putting it where the administration building currently is. Same issue, not enough land there, um, didn't solve the loading dock issue. And for both of those schemes, we had to displace about 12 to 15,000 square foot of office space on site, on campus office space, that there's no place to put those folks. Um, we looked at locating the energy center on the north side of First Street, northwest. Several issues there. It gets it closer to the neighborhood. We want to eliminate noise to the neighborhood as much as possible. It also, we have to cross utilities to interconnect the energy center to the hospital across the public way. And it doesn't solve the loading dock issue. Um, we looked at putting it in the cancer center parking lot. Obviously, we have to have patients uh, park close to the cancer center in entrance, and it just wouldn't work there. Um, we looked at putting it on top of the hospital and where the oxygen tanks are. Also, very difficult to do it there. Structurally, it won't work. You have to put fuel above occupied buildings. Just lots of issues. It just doesn't work, and it didn't solve the loading dock issue. So, um, really, the best location for the loading dock and energy center is on the north side. Um, as you know, we have public access, patient access on both on all three sides of the hospital, the east, the south, and the west. We can't really change that. All the utilities, all the supplies come and go from the back of the hospital. Very difficult to change. This, the project that is proposed for the improvements was the best viable solution we came up with. And we encourage all of you to uh, support it and allow the hospital to grow and improve our health care offerings to the community. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Graham. Good evening, Mr. Applegate. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, my name is Monty Applegate. I'm a landscape architect with the Aggie Colby Associates here in Mason City. And I've been working with Mercy on this project and specifically in regards to um, any landscape components um, and buffer design. Uh, working with uh, the hospital and also some of the neighbors here in the past few weeks, uh, looking at things uh, related to uh, fence design, fence materials, height, location, those type of issues, as well as sharing with them some um, possible uh, landscape plant material types, um, where some of those plantings could occur to provide not only um, aesthetic 
improvements for, for themselves and for the hospital, uh, but also to help uh, provide some screening opportunities as well and the possibility of doing some uh, noise suppression um, along that buffer area. Uh, one of the last things that I did um, as part of item number nine uh, that the council requested was to conduct a, cre a tree condition survey and tree count. And I went out and walked the site last week and you'll see that in your packet. These are results of my uh, inventory. What I looked at was uh, the overall tree count uh, within the project area, uh, the estimated number of trees that we could save based on our latest concept, uh, the tree species that, that uh, occur on the, in the project area, and the overall tree condition. Um, and again, this corresponds to a map you also have in your packet. I broke it up into areas, and they're basically almost per lot as you follow along the street. And so you can see, um, basically, we have 75 trees uh, within the project area. Um, most of them are oak, 68 are oak, a couple maple, elm, ash, cottonwood, birch, and black cherry. Um, I would say, just from my analysis, that overall the tree condition is in pretty good shape. Um, as you know, the past couple of years we've had some drought conditions. It certainly has put some stress on the trees within the project area and in the community as a whole. Um, a lot of times that will cause a little bit of crown dieback. Um, and certainly this year you're seeing a little bit of premature leaf drop for a lot of trees. It's not necessarily harmful to the trees, they're just reacting. Uh, they're using up all their energy basically uh, because of the drought conditions. Um, so overall, we did have a, some, some observations of some tree dieback. I think there was about nine or 10 trees that I uh, looked at that had you know, anywhere from 30, 50, and then one tree had 90% dieback and one, one old tree was dead. Um, so you know, what we're looking at there is that overall, I think the trees are in pretty good, pretty good shape. Um, right now, based on our latest concept, we have 30 trees that we're anticipating that are healthy that, that will be saved as part of this project. Now keep in mind too, as we move forward, uh, we're going to be planting new trees as part of our buffer improvements. And um, you know, right now we have a majority of oak. Um, if we have disease issues like Dutch elm back in the 70s, or we have right now, <coughs> uh, we're having him with with our ash trees. Um, it's good to diversify in this area, so we're going to look at putting in different species of trees, such as uh, lindens, maples, and so forth, to try to head off any potential problems in the future. So with that, if you have any questions, I can answer those with that. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, thank you, sir. Mayor, members of the council, uh, my name is Harry Doyle, as Hal Hudson mentioned before, and I'm senior principal with Modus Consulting Engineers. Modus Consulting Engineers is a mechanical and electrical consulting engineering firm. That's all we do is consulting. And proud to announce we're going to have our 50 year anniversary in Iowa next year. So I know many of you have worked on many of your facilities. And the hospital has hired us as mechanical electrical consultants and we've been studying um, the needs that have been represented here tonight for some time. And I'm specifically here to address two questions that are on your handout, question four and question 10, and that deals with noise and it also deals um, with the uh, energy center concerns as far as generator placement, which you've already heard some about. I'm just kind of embellish that. Let's start with um, the need. Um, the, the need, the basic need for the hospital to improve and replace its generators is because they are old, they aren't sufficient capacity, they're difficult to main, maintain, excuse me, they're of a voltage, they're of a voltage class where the parts are getting rare. Bottom line is they're going to have to be replaced this year, next year, the year after, it's not a question to maintain those generators. Uh, the generators in the facility cannot do certain things. I cannot emphasize this enough because the hospital is there to serve the community. It, it cannot provide for cooling operation in the facility. What does that mean? That means that if there is a summer interruption in a very short amount of time, the majority of the computer systems within the hospital are shut down. We all know what happens when the computer systems are shut down in the facility. Patient care stops. In addition to that, the temperatures within the surgery rooms in the summer will become at a level where it's, they're unable to provide basic surgery services. Your hospital will resort to a triage style facility and you'll have to outpatient everybody. 
So the generators are critical to the facility. The National Electric Code and the National Fire Protection Association states by code that the hospital will do certain things. And it says that they will provide on-site generation that's essential for the operation for normal service within the hospital. And it goes on to specifically say, and this was a question that was raised, the rental of emergency generators on an ad needed basis is not an option. So we don't have that option. It's, it's an emergency option. It's not a program option. There's, there's a clarification there. Uh, the generators do provide an opportunity for the hospital for improvement, for it to become more robust, more stable, uh, to become uh, to better serve its, its function as charge within the hospital or within the community. And also it reduces maintenance and risk. Let me quickly address uh, the issue of noise. Noise is very important. And in the packet there was a handout, hopefully to put in perspective the noise concerns must emphasize the generators will only operate by tariff with, with the utility company no more than three days, three equivalent days out of the year. Basically, they're off. And that's only if the utility company needs them. Um, the city ordinance at 65 dB is what any, any noise at your property line needs to be. That's conversational speech. 70 dB is you taking a shower. Your lawnmower is much louder and much more frequent than these generators will run. Um, the generators we've chosen to put are going to be enclosed in the building. We want these things to be very quiet when they do run. You should, unless you happen to be in and around the building, you'll probably never notice that they do run that totally enclosed within a concrete structure. Our, my job is to be sure that we meet the city ordinance and our objective is to better the city ordinance and actually we want to be a good partner. We want everybody to be proud of what we're doing personally and as a community. Um, I think that about does it and we have to entertain any questions for 45 seconds. Thank you very much. All right. Appreciate it, Mr. Well. Mr. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Rod Schlater, Interim CEO at Mercy. I want to answer uh, Councilman uh, Council Member uh, Tornquist's question last time. It wasn't in the letter that we got from staff, but he was asking about how many people we serve. Uh, we serve a population of 201,000. Uh, we, we serve a 14 county area. Uh, we roughly have a 50% market share of that 200,000 people, so we serve 100,000 people annually at our facility, much larger than uh, Mason City population. And we're proud of that expansion and we're a regional, we're a regional referral center and uh, I won't go into how that benefits the community. I think you're all aware of that. A couple of questions on the, the letter from staff. Um, question number two was about would, this, would the phase two of this project be abandoned? Uh, the answer to that is no. Um, it's being delayed. Uh, our corporate office has a funding <coughs> process every year, like most corporations, and uh, they asked us to split this project into two parts. We fully expect the second part to be approved uh, next fiscal year, and uh, they pretty much have said that. They understand the need that we have. Uh, question number 12 uh, was raised, you know, should we have a, a member of force of the Forest Park area neighborhood on our board. And we currently have a member on our uh, one of our committees of the board, the Planning, Marketing, and Legislative Affairs, and we're certainly open to adding a resident to our board once the current member's term expires. So, let's see, any questions? Thanks, sir. Good evening. Pull the mic down there so everybody can hear you. I will. Um, my name is Rose Schleer, and my husband Joseph and I live at 112 South Taylor Avenue. And I want to state at the beginning that Joseph and I are both retired employees of the hospital, but I am here in the capacity tonight as a neighbor. We are adjacent property owners to the Mercy campus, and we have lived here for 45 years. And in that time, we have witnessed an abundance of growth and change. Once upon a time, the emergency entrance was on the north, 
the main entrance was on the east and the cancer center did not exist. In some ways, the hospital has literally turned itself around while maintaining operation 24-7. Our lives and property have been hugely affected and impacted over these 45 years. So we understand and relate to the concerns of the neighbors because we are a neighbor. But we have always balanced that challenge with the knowledge that we and all of Mason City and the North Iowa area have access to quality health care in our midst. That is as important to us today as it was 45 years ago when we first chose to move into Forest Park. The downside is that we live in a residential area where the city's largest employer wishes to expand and add services. The upside is that we live in a very desirable neighborhood with a state-of-the-art healthcare facility across the street. We have always tried to keep a health, healthy perspective on this dilemma and this tension in our lives. Many will not remember this, but years and years ago, people being treated for chemical dependency and that entire program were located for a time in Macaulay Hall, which is directly across the street from us. We had seven little children and thought that that might be a risk. But then we felt that the need of support of the clients was the greater good. When the ER was on the north, ambulances coming from the west came down Taylor Avenue to reach the ER. The noise was a profound distraction, but the life that was in jeopardy and could possibly be saved was of overriding value. Noise is fleeting, life is precious. That same logic still guides our thoughts at this time. We are not trying to minimize in any way the impact on the neighborhood of this project. We acknowledge and respect the genuine concerns of our Forest Park neighbors, but we also look at the greater good of the neighbors we have in the whole North Iowa area, and we want them to have safe access to quality health care for themselves and their families. Therefore, we support the Mercy Project and their vision for the future. We have tried to be good neighbors and we feel that Mercy is trying to be a good neighbor in very, very difficult circumstances. Thank you. Thank you. Tell it. Tell the study is completed. 
Where is Mercy Hospital's master plan? Why is so much of this a mystery? What are the alternatives? Mercy Hospital has open areas to the south parking lot, southeast parking lot, southwest parking lot. Land is precious and good use of what we have should be top priority. Parking lot areas could be used for expansion if parking structures replace surface parking, smart use of land. It is more expensive to go up than spread out, but the spreading out is costing the neighborhoods, and there is still the issue of generators. It's Macaulay, it isn't Macaulay Hall outdated? Tear that down and put the facility in one of the parking lots It would give you plenty of space for your power plant. While I sat at my computer, I was able to pull up some very interesting information. The big one was safety at the loading dock. Let me read to you uh, dangers at the loading dock. There can be, a very, can be very serious accidents on loading bays. One example is trailer creep, also known as trailer walk or dock walk, which occurs when the lateral and vertical force is exerted each time a forklift truck enters and exits the trailer because the trailer too slowly moved away from the dock resulting in separation from the dock leveler. Factors that affect trailer creep are the weight and speed of the lift truck and load, the slope of the ground the trailer is parked on, the condition of the suspension and the air pressures, the type of transition, dock levelers, board, dock boards use, being used, and whether the trailer has been disconnected or it is or if it is still connected to the, tra the tractor. Separation of a vehicle from the loading dock also occurs when a driver prematurely pulls away while the truck is still being loaded, unloaded. This issue is usually caused through a driver not correctly observing traffic lighting signals on the rolling loading bay, which prohibit the movement of the trailer. It is also important to ensure the drivers are adequately trained on the safe system of work heat or she is expected to follow. Okay, the, uh, the next one would be, uh, let me read from that, it's a computer, dimensions for a turnaround of, for a semi-truck. Depends on the overall length of the tractor-trailer combination. In the USA, a tractor with a big sleeper and towing, a 53 feet trailer could be 80 feet long, the needs to, need, and needs a bit more than that, much than that much space to do a turnaround. Trucks towing double or triple trailers are even longer and can't do short turnarounds. If you're designing a parking lot, then it's best to leave a bit of extra room for trucks to maneuver or make pull-through sites where they don't have to turn around. Kind of hard to give a standard when it's not known which turnaround method you're using. A semi will turn in its own length, jackknifing, Considering a 50-foot trailer and a 12-foot of feet of cab, a 62-foot circular turnaround would suffice, but you're stretching the air hoses. This is what we this is what we want. Is this what we want to live with live with in a family neighborhood? Folks of Mason City, take heed. The policy set here can and will affect the whole of Mason City, not just one neighborhood. Thank you. Thank hey, you. Come out. Good evening. Hi, I'm John Fishback. I'm at 10 South Taylor in Mason City. And I'm uh, speaking to the zone uh, question here at Mercy. I want to say this is the first time I've downloaded and printed off a packet for a city council meeting and it's increased my uh, respect for all of you and how you have to spend your weekend before every meeting. Uh, but there's, it's been enlightening for me. Uh, I wanna say thank you to Rose. I think she has expressed the feelings of most all of us in the neighborhood, even those impacted negatively by this situation and we we do know how important the hospital is but in looking through that packet at the last council meeting I was shocked 
but learned that Mercy put their patients at risk because it had not planned ahead well enough to meet its emergency power needs. But now while reading the staff reports in the packet, I see that Mercy has been planning this expansion not just for a year now when it first approached staff, the Mesa City staff, but for three to four years while planning the emergency room expansion as well. At least two of my neighbors have told me that they asked Mercy within the last two years if it was going to move north, and they were told no. Now, I make these points not to be snarky, although that is kind of fun, but to underline the credibility gap between what our good neighbor, Mercy, says and what it does. I see in the packet and addressed tonight by the engineer, about the question about the generator noise. Mercy tells us the generator will rarely be running. I'd like to believe that. But how often will the chiller, also housed in the energy building, be running? And just how many decibels will it be? I've been told it will not be an issue. I'd like to believe that. Do you suppose the council could get a report on the chiller noise as well. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you, Mr. Fishback. Oh, yeah. Good evening. Welcome. I'm Mindy. based on some questions raised. The Mercy has provided information from their consultants, engineers, and architects, which of course supports their views and assert that no other solutions could be found. While the cadre of consultants are impressive, I am certain that these same individuals could quickly produce other solutions once the zoning request is denied. The request shared between the city and Mercy contained the wording this does not have to be a full-blown distributional study, but instead a professional opinion. It goes on to say, these do not have to be extremely detailed, but need to have the stamp of an expert. I would just like to ask, who is going to do a study that takes the perspective of the resident into account? I am just a lay person. I really um, have learned a lot, um, and thank you, Tricia, for helping us with the procedure. Um, but I've spent countless hours researching this issue. We're just a group of homeowners going up against a well-funded corporation. Does the city or state speak for us in asking for independently conducted study on traffic that shows our streets as well? Safety, air quality, and quality of life? I hope so. Also, there are many unanswered questions related to the zoning issue that weren't raised to Mercy, but appear to be a significant part of the zoning approval process. Where are the completed drawings, especially of the loading dock? What does the new loading dock that will be so perilously close to my house even look like? What is it made out of? What is the lighting plan? We could easily just refer to questions 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, and 15 on the zoning checklist to form a list of the many unanswered questions. The zoning request cannot pass in good faith. And what about the issue of property values, which was brought up at the last meeting? Last week, Doug Campbell showed how our properties are highly valued and how they will be dragged down. The sudden adjoining of our residential property to land not zoned residential, then moving a street and the accompanying noise and fumes of a commercial distribution center, or similar, uh, to my back door creates a nuisance, and that is also addressed in the Iowa State Law. This brings me to the, oh, another point. In the fall of 2011, the hospital planned to pursue this course publicly. They started work with the neighbors, uh, actually, they only started to work with the neighbors after applying for the rezoning later. Um, because we live in such a good area, people are continually investing in their homes, and we just feel like um, we're blindsided by this, and we would like you to reconsider the zoning of the Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Eric Dunsky, 85 Lemon Drive. And 
don't know, everything's so technical these days. <laughs> Just trying to get a sense of where we are and what we're talking about. And so I sit and I look at where we are today. Okay, that's the distance we're talking about that'll separate my home to Alabama in fact to my home to the commercial loading dock. Um, it's hard to understand why we're so concerned unless you live in the neighborhood. Um, obviously, we like the neighborhood. We want to make sure that it stays intact. And one of the things we're concerned about is that's just a small steak truck backing up yesterday, actually on Monday morning, about 7.15. This morning, I know it was an unusual situation. I appreciate it, but there was a truck that worked for 40 minutes with that kind of a sound to relocate the dumpster, and we had to listen to it. I, I was woken up by the sound, thinking it was my son's alarm clock, but actually it was that same tone going on and on for over 40 minutes. So that, that's the real issue is, when you put that kind of noise, 35 feet, like we just shot, I just showed you from the back lot. You've introduced a lot of noise into a residential area. I also want to question when I go around town, I don't see anywhere else like it. I see loading docks in commercial areas. I also did a slight survey, I mentioned at the Planning and Zoning Commission, where I called UPS and FedEx and just asked them how many semis do you have going in and out? And the answer I got on the survey was for each location, five. What Mercy's talking about today is between eight and 10. It's on an average. So we're just wondering from the standpoint of commercial loading, is that appropriate to where we And thank you very much for your patience and appreciate it. Thank you. to the census or an obstruction to the free use of property so as to essentially interfere unreasonably with the comfortable enjoyment of life or property is a nuisance. Skipping a little bit later, tells about the, how to file a petition about that, we won't go into that. The following rules and analysis are applied in determining whether one's use of his property constitutes a nuisance. Whether a lawful business is a nuisance depends on the reasonableness of conducting the business in the manner, at the place, under the circumstances in question. Thus, the existence of a nuisance does not depend on the intention of the party who created it. Rather, it depends upon the following three factors, priority of location, the nature of the neighborhood, and the wrong complaint of. A fact finder uses a normal person standard to determine whether a nuisance involving personal discomfort or annoyance is significant enough to constitute a nuisance. The normal per person standard is an objective standard. <coughs> if normal persons living in the community regard the invasion in question as definitely offensive, seriously <coughs> annoying, or intolerable, then the invasion is significant. I then pulled up the city code of Mason City and I found the following information, pretty much the same, under nuisances. Whatever is injurious to health, incident, or offensive to the senses, or an obstacle to free use of the property, so essentially to interfere with the comfortable enjoyment of life or property. 
The following, although not all inclusive, are declared to be nuisances. The erecting, continuing, or using any building, building or other places for the exercise of any trade employment or manufactured which by occasional noxious fumes, offensive smells, or other annoyances becomes injurious and dangerous to the health, comfortable, or property individuals or the public. The cause or suffering on any awful, filth, or noisome substance to accumulate or to remain in any place to the prejudice of others. The obstructing or encumbrances by fences, buildings, or otherwise the public roads, private right-of-ways, streets, alleys, commons, landing places, or burying grounds. The emission of dense smoke, not just fumes, or flying ants. <coughs> any building or portion thereof which any of the following listed conditions exist, either individually or combination with each other to the extent of being injurious to health, indecent, or offensive to the senses, or an obstruction to the free use of property, so as to essentially interfere with the comfortable enjoyment of life or property is a nuisance. Also pulled up, see we have a River City Trees Commission. Um, the commission will work toward deforestation and education of the citizens of Mason City. The Historic Preservation Commission. The purpose and intent of this commission shall be to promote the educational, cultural, economic, and general welfare of the public to the recognition, enhancement, and perpetuation of sites and districts of historical and cultural significance. They will safeguard the city's historic, aesthetic, and cultural heritage by preserving the sites and districts of historic and cultural significance. They will foster pride in the legacy of beauty and achievements of the past, and they will stabilize and improve property values. So in closing, um, the Iowa Code and City Code covers many of our concerns about the Mercy Project. Um, the noise, the filth from construction, Offensive smells, emissions, fumes, um, and mostly stabilization of property values, and also the obstruction to free use of property so as to <coughs> essentially interfere with the comfortable enjoyment of life and our properties. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Christopher Swinton, 70 South Pierce Avenue. Um, while I share the frustrations and concerns with the Forest Park neighborhood, I would like to ask them a the simple question. If the power goes out, yeah, Mercy, can you live with yourselves for those folks in the critical care unit? And if this project does not go through, what if all that money we, I spend in Mercy, I have, I will have to spend a half on the uh, to the Mayo Clinic or Iowa City. And it's my part-time job, I cannot afford that. So, can you guys honestly live with yourselves if you uh, do not let the power project and the, all these improvements go through at the hospital? But then, otherwise, we'll just be shut first down and all those jobs and go to Mayo or Iowa City. Can you live with yourself? That's it. That is the question. Thank you. <clears throat> Diana Jarvel, 1140 West State Street. Um, I'm a resident of the Forest Park neighborhood. The word neighborhood has been used in many ways as of late, and I would like to address a few points on that. The only part of the neighborhood that was notified of the changes that Mercy is trying to go through right now are people within 300 foot radius of First Street Southwest. Forest Park neighborhood, as you know, runs from First Street Northwest to Fourth Street Southwest, from Pierce to Beaumont. To continue being a good neighbor, anything that directly affects our neighborhood, we should all be formally informed. Putting an ad in the Globe Gazette that most of us don't read is not going to inform us of what Mercy is planning on doing that is going to affect our neighborhood. First and foremost, the values of our homes. John Veronica said at the Planning and Zoning Committee meeting that the realtors are being remiss in not telling future buyers in our neighborhood that Mercy will expand in the future. 
If that is the case, then the possibility of selling our homes is slim to none. In the last two years, there were 27 homes for sale in our neighborhood with an average of 296 days on the market. These homes did not sell and the listings expired. We currently have five homes for sale on West State Street, two blocks. One is in the affected 300 square foot, or 300 foot area and has been on the market for 521 days and is on its third realtor. What is on its third listing is in the 1100 block and has been on the market for 445 days within two blocks. If the expansion of Mercy is keeping these homes from selling, then it would seem to me that there needs to be some transparency in Mercy's future plans for this neighborhood. And I ask the elected city council to require Mercy to come up with a 20 year comprehensive plan so we as a neighborhood and community know what the future holds for us, all of us, as a community. Mercy has not shown that the neighborhood's best interests are important when the letter dated September 12th of 2012 from Berlin and Cram stated that the emergency room and the energy center projects had been considered at the same time. If that's the case, then the energy center has been on the table for at least three years and has only been brought to the attention of the neighborhood this past June, and only a certain part of it. We all realize now that Mercy will continue, continue to expand, and if that is the case, then there should be a comprehensive plan in place and a systematic buyout of our property, because at this point in time, we cannot sell it ourselves. Walking on the edge of the knife is no way to live. For those of us who have become involved in what's going on, that's what we feel like we're doing. We can't sell our homes. We certainly don't dare plan on updating or remodeling because the money invested won't come back to us in the sale of our home because Mercy's expansions are unknown. If you pass the rezoning and the closing of the streets, you have tied our hands even tighter than they already are. I ask that you, if that is your intention to vote yes on this project, you also need to keep us taxpayers in mind and request from Mercy a comprehensive plan. Thank you. Thank you. Cheryl Greer, 1152 East State, but I also own the property on the west side of town. I'm here to address
I know the quality of other hospitals. I know how they operate. And I know that if Mercy leaves today or goes on strike, that we have many fine medical facilities move in that wouldn't want to monopolize the area. They would not be hand in hand with the city and they would not, they would be concerned about our water quality and the people who are ill from our water. It's interesting, I wonder what kind of interesting water of weight. And, and in that area where that house is for sale, that street's been torn up and torn up and torn up and torn up for utilities. Do you think that maybe all those bathrooms and all of that, that Mercy has affected the utilities in that area? Or was the reason that they got a new sewer this summer to try and offset this? This issue needs to be taken, and Mercy needs to do the right thing. The same issue came up in Grinnell, where the mayor promised a street because Grinnell was a large employer. Once the Des Moines Register, unlike our local paper, focused an investigated report on it, Grinnell did the right thing, the college, and they withdrew the offer. Mercy may own the houses on First Southwest, but they do not own that street. That street belongs to the citizens of Mason City. And they have had enough streets. They have had plenty of time to honor their commitments that they have made. As for patient care, I don't believe that anybody, I wonder how Mercy can live with itself. When I was three and a half, Mercy declared a person dead that wasn't dead. They called because that's what the police did. Um, a highway patrolman said, well, but the funeral home won't take this person because they're moaning and groaning. You could at least go out and double check. But they refused. Because they didn't know the ability to, to pay. My <laughs> mother died of a heart attack because they denied the life saving of having abducted with Snells. This is just like the issue with Snells. It all sounds like We're talking like about a rezoning issue here. Thank you.